one of the chapters in your book, or one of the sections, I should say, of Clearance and Copyright, Everything You Need to Know for Film and Television, is entitled, To Ask or Not to Ask? That is the question. <laughs> so uh, what would that entail? What is a filmmaker asking? Is they, are they asking a copyright holder for permission? Yeah, and I think this, again, is, is one of those a misconception people have, that if they do ask, they can't fair use something. Or if they get a quote for something, it affects whether or not they can use something under the under the fair use doctrine, and it really doesn't. I think from a risk risk perspective, which I'll explain in a little bit, it can. But from a legal perspective, if you're going to go out to the copyright holder and ask for a license fee, and or ask for how much it would cost to license something, and they come back and it's an exorbitant amount and you can't afford it, you still can fair use that material. It doesn't affect the fair use argument at all. What it does do, though, is it puts you on the radar for that license holder. And then they'll follow up with you and say, hey, are you gonna license that from us? You know, we sent you that quote. And then you have to have sort of an awkward conversation of, no, we're actually using it under fair use now. And they say, no, it's not fair use. It's absolutely not fair use. You have to license it from us. And then they come to us and they say, well, what should we do? And so it kind of, it can create a little bit of an uncomfortable situation, which I think all it really is. It's not a legal factor. Um, and also can create a little bit more in legal fees because then you're all of a sudden paying us or someone else to negotiate with these guys. And sometimes in order to avoid a dispute or to, to keep a good relationship, you will license something and maybe for a lesser fee saying this really is fair use, but we're happy to license it from you, but we're not going to pay you what you asked as um, so you enter into that negotiation. So, you know, to ask or not to ask is a question we get a lot. And typically I'll say, you know, you shouldn't ask. And it's not because we're trying to hide anything, but it's because the person who's licensing the footage to you or whatever it is doesn't want to have that conversation. It's not in their best interest. And in order to elevate it up to the lawyers who would be making the decision on whether or not it's fair use, it isn't really worth anybody's time. Do you know what I mean? So I usually say don't ask unless there is a reason to ask. You know, maybe there's a relationship there. Maybe you're you're delivering a film to Paramount and you want to use a film from use a clip from a film that also is owned by Paramount. Then you probably should ask and have that discussion. But um, typically, if it's just a run of the mill, I want to use this news clip in my documentary and it's clearly fair use. I would not go and, and ask for a license if you know you're not going to license it. I also like to have insurance in place before you go asking. Right. Um, it just makes everything more comfortable. And if the price is very high, uh, we talk about, to the filmmakers, about different ways of sort of excusing oneself from the conversation for as long as possible without waving the fair use flag. Yeah. Uh, it's, because um, especially at the studios and the networks, the person that you talk to as a filmmaker has as his or her sole job licensing clips and their whole uh, compensation, their value to the company is how much money did you bring in licensing clips? So they just will, you know, the hairs on the back of their neck will stand up when you start talking about fair use. Well, let's say I'm a documentary filmmaker and I'm making uh, a film about, let's say, activism in the 60s and I want to use a clip from a folk singer and this folk singer is still alive, let's say, would I just reach out to their personal website and send a nice email but already have this e &O insurance policy in place mm -hmm. and just play nice first? Yeah, well you may but you also may not because, uh, you know, my viewpoint and maybe I'm being lazy about it but it's like who wants to have that conversation? If you don't really have an intent to license it's sort of a waste of everybody's time. In a sense, it could be considered kind of rude. Like, why are you calling me if you're not planning on licensing this for me? So unless, you know, Michael's example is a perfect example where there was a negotiation there, they had already maybe even agreed on some terms, then it's, it makes sense from a business standpoint to continue that discussion and to let them know. But to just reach out to the folk singer when you really have no intention of actually licensing it, I think is, is counterproductive. You know, it's just not... It's not necessary, and it, it's kind of a waste of everybody's time. And in this case, since I already mentioned what the film was about, um, the uh, one of the producers they want to maintain a relationship, so it's right. makes sense to call and have a courtesy call. Say, you know, we we got turned down. We worked on the film to make sure everything came within fair use. They have insurance, but I certainly wanted you to know about it. 
and they uh, they ask to see the film, it's it's fine. Yeah. You know, and the opposite happens as well, where somebody does have an intention to license most or all of what's in their film, and then they try to license certain things, and the license doesn't work out for some reason. You know, some say they won't license in perpetuity, and they have to, and the producer is under an obligation to get all licenses in perpetuity. Um, so then you have the discussion, I'm dealing with this right now, where I have a client who's wanted to license everything. Um, one entity has come back and said, we can't give you a license in perpetuity. We can give it to you for 30 years, but it was an exorbitant cost. It was something about three times what they were paying for other archival material that was similar. And so she said, how should I respond? I said, get back to them and say, you know, we can't license at that amount. We're happy to license it if you could meet our $100 a second rate that we're doing with everybody else. And if not, we're going to have to pass on the license. And so we're dealing with that now, but that was kind of the converse of what we were talking about before, where they really did intend to license everything, and then they're just running into hurdles. And if they can license it, great. If not, we're going to use it under fair use. Curious but, about... But it's oh. interesting, mm -hmm. the way you phrase that. They say, we'll just have to pass on the license, as opposed to, we we're going to use it anyway, right. screw you. <laughs> you know, it, it's yeah. all, there's a, play nice. a lot of... Um, uh, and I think it's more than just playing nice. Yeah, good point. It's a consideration for two things. One is they do own the copyright, make a lot of money, and two, very important, the person you're talking to at a studio has this very narrow job of maximizing income from licensing clips. And and what you're basically doing is is a threat to the job. Certainly if it was very widespread, this person would not be able to bring in as much money to the studio, therefore they wouldn't be making as much. You know, it's a really very, uh, I, 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 and this goes for everything in life, every negotiation you ever have. You want to understand the other person's position. They're not being jerks, they just have this very narrow eight hour a day, five days a week job that they're doing and they're not bad people, they just, have very narrow limits, very narrow authority, they have a rate card, and their job is to get that rate on every clip that's used of any material from that studio. That's their job. Yeah. That was my next question, was the tone of all the correspondence, because so many people get excited when they see, oh, that's my whatever, and, and you know, and, and as you said, playing nice. So the tone well, should always be non-accusatory uh, yeah. for most of the exchange, yeah. it sounds we're, like. We're not litigators. And very often, you know, a lawyer will call very bombastically and say, oh, you've got an upset client. And I don't blame them for being upset. You know, it, you have to understand where they're coming from. And that makes it easy to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. And I also, you know, that's our, our philosophy and the way we work in this office is that we are collegial and I think it makes our jobs a lot easier. We represent copyright holders. So we're not looking to screw anybody over or get something that's not ours or you know anything like that. And so when we get that angry call, we do understand. And it's not, you know, as I said before, playing nice. It's not playing. We really are nice because we <laughs> certainly understand. And um, and I think that's what makes it makes our job easier and makes it much easier to come to a resolution with people. Because we don't call them and say, screw you, it's fair use, and you know, sue us. We really, after we get that call, we respond collegially with an educated response of, we understand you're upset, but this is the law that we've based our opinion on. And oftentimes Michael likes to throw in a copy of the book and throw in the copy of the 150 <laughs> page article that he wrote and say, you know, <laughs> we didn't just willy nilly say fair use on this. Like we really have based this on, on education and a study of the law and a deep understanding of this area. 